I came to talk today to an old friend of mine, Alba Bouchard, a farmer, all his life. Lives on the strip road here that goes into Slybrook Road to Soldier Pond, New Canada, and Eagle Lake. And this is his view. We're looking at Walla Grass here. 23rd of uh, April, there's still some snow. It's a rainy day, but we have promises of beautiful weather into the 60s for the weekend. Today's Thursday. I would think the sun sets in front here. It's a wall of grass before it can dip Allah. We are with Albin Bouchard in his home, his new home. Albin, when did you build this home here? We built that in 1991. Already? Been here since 1991. Yeah. 18 years, huh? Yeah. Mais sans que ça fait pas si longtemps que ça. Albin is uh, one of the, well, I'm saying that not too many farmers left. Well, you're one of the few left. You haven't been farming for a while. You've been retired. Uh, I don't know what you call retiring, <laughs> but uh, yes, I passed the farm over to Joe when I when we built this home here, and he is the uh, the one who's uh, taking care of the uh, the farming part of the Why? business. Now, how old are you, Wildman? Hate to ask you. 80, 82 next month. Sure. Yeah. Dans bonne santé. Well, as far as I can find out, yes. You just spend the uh, winter in Florida? Well, we spent two and a half months in Florida. We've been doing that for the past four or five years. Uh, they say Florida was a little cool this year. It was a little cool. February was very cool this year, especially yeah. we were on the West Coast. And the uh, wind from the Gulf is always cold. Oh, I see. So the weather was in the... Oh, I would say maybe 65 and 70s most of the time. Why? But the wind made it feel a lot chillier. Oh, okay. But it was not compared to what we experienced here. <laughs> we had a cold winter. Uh, luckily, not as much snow as last year. Last year was bad. Yes. So we're on the 23rd of April here, and uh, this is a typical April for us, huh? Always a little uh, rainy. Yes, uh, we've got something growing, going for us because the ground is not froze. As soon as the weather melts the snow, inside of uh, a week or so, you could be on the ground. Is that right? Yes. Uh, start planting something. Uh, yes, uh, grain should be starting to put grain in maybe around the the 10th of May. Yeah. That's the first thing you can plant? Grain? Not necessarily. When when the ground is good for grain, it's good for potatoes and it's good for okay. most anything. Oh, okay. But usually you'd like to get your grain in first because you can harvest before uh, you harvest your potatoes. Oh, okay. Now let's talk about the Bouchard farm here. Uh, uh, how big is it? How big was it? Uh, has it changed much in your... Well, right now, well, it, it, it was not always like this. When the, the, it, the Bouchard first started way back in the 1800s, uh, there was not much land there. There was maybe, I would say maybe 50, 60 acres of land. Of cultivated land. Of cultivated land. The rest was wood? Well, yes, and even then, how can we say that it was cultivated way back in the 1800s? Yeah. You know, when the people migrated up the uh, Fish River, and that's where my ancestors came from the St. John River up the Fish River, and this is where they landed, right above the Fish River Falls. And uh, then they migrated up a little from the river, and they, they, they started homesteading. We're talking uh, no roads at the time? We're talking no roads at the time. Okay, so the river's the road. The, the river was the road. Yeah. Uh, 
there are always has been a path, horseback right. or uh, whatever you might. A trail. <laughs> yes, yes. So they migrated up to that path, and that's why they started to build a home. Now, how did they get the land? Do you know? Uh, first off, they were squatters. Squatters? They were squatters. A, a lot of farms around here, that's the way they've been established. They were squatters. Uh, they didn't own it. They didn't own it. They lived on it for so many years. Well, in, in the case of my ancestors, uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts with the state of Maine was owned by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. If you were a squatter and you lived on that piece of property for a number of years, you were entitled to have a deed from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And this is what my ancestors had a deed from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Is that right? And that happened in the 18, uh, I would say maybe in the 1830s. Yep. Way back. Way back. Yes. Because yes. Maine became a state in 1820, so it's about that time now. Well, it, it could be, but uh, as far as the, uh, the, the deed was saying, that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts was deeded the land in 1831, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Why did not the state of Maine deed it to these people? I don't know. It's a good question. I, well, this is what I... Now, do you know who that Bouchard, was it a Bouchard that had this land? Yes. Do yes. you know his name? This is what this was his father. Charles was his father then. Now this couple over there are yes. the descendants of this. Uh, yes, this is this is Charles' son. Okay, Okay, now we're looking at the the son of the first of the squatter, really. Right. The son of Charles. Bouchard, who landed on this side of the Fish River, and that's his wife. Do you know who she is? Uh, geez, I, I, knew, I think it's Demaris. So what's his name, this guy? This Israel. Israel? Israel. Israel Bouchard. Hey, boys, huh? C'est des beaux noms, hein? Il n'y a pas de petits gars qui se font appeler Israël aujourd'hui. Can you tell me when he was born? That's his, that was his third wife. Third wife? Yeah. What was her name? Was it uh, Sarah? Elle dit que c'est Demerise. Yeah, I don't think so. Pas Demerise? Denise. Denise. Yeah, Denise. Denise. Ça fait pas de différence. We're saying here, your wife just told us there that uh, Monsieur Israel Bouchard, who yes. was the son of the first uh, yes. Bouchard, Charles Bouchard, is pictured with his third wife. He's pictured with his third wife, yes. And so, uh, you, you, do you, what do you think happened to the first two? The first two died of childbirth. He had, uh, the, his first wife, he had three ch ch children with her, with him. And his second wife, he didn't have any children. Oh, okay. Uh, as far as I know, of what we've read through genealogies, this woman comes from Louisiana. Wow. How they met <laughs> is anybody's guess. <laughs> uh, apparently, she was one of them, the Acadians that was deported from uh, Nova Scotia. Oh, okay. And uh, a lot of them uh, migrated to the, the west. In Illinois, you've got a lot of Bouchards there. They're all... Is that right? My, my relatives. Isn't that something? My ancestors. Yeah, they had to go, some of them went up to Quebec and... Yes, yes. Louisiana, out west. Yes, 
Yeah. Yes, a lot of them were deported to Louisiana. They were put on boats and yeah. they were deported down to Louisiana. Yeah. Uh, what we have here uh, came uh, by uh, by boat most mostly. Yeah. They migrated to the St. John River and then they they boated up to uh, the Frenchville area Frenchville, where yeah. they. Yeah. They established a residence. Now, did he have a lot of kids with her, Lily? He, he had three kids with her. And uh, I have to tell you first where that picture, where we obtained that picture. Yeah, that's an old picture. I bought a, a farm that belonged to this Israel, which is my neighbor. I bought that way back when, oh, I would say maybe 20 years ago I bought that. There was a fairly decent barn in there, and uh, after I bought it, uh, my wife went into the, the building and she found three pictures like that in the barn. Why it was there, I don't know. But one was a picture of Jesus Christ, or I don't know what you call it, great big, great big picture, which is, it, it's downstairs, you can see it if you want to. But that picture, we had it restored, put a new frame on it, and Jalbert was the one who restored it. Well, we didn't know who they were, but it was a very nice picture. So, uh, my wife said, we've got to find out who, who these, uh, these people are. Yeah. So there was a, uh, a few elderly ladies that were living in the uh, senior citizen in back of the church. And they used to live around here somewhere. So Rita took that picture and she brought it to them. They were in their 80s then, maybe older than 80, but they were in their 80s then. Well, as soon as they, she sold her their picture, the woman started crying, cried. Well, she says, I've got to get my sister to see that. So she called her sister, which was living next door. They came to see that, and they both cried. Apparently, this was her father and mother. Wow. Holy jeez. So uh, this is the, how we verify that picture and who these people are. Now well, who came after Israel? Israel. Here, here you have a picture in back of you there. I'm going to go see it later. That this is, is my father. This is your father? Come accept that. His father was Herbie. Your grandfather was Herbie? No, my father was Herbie. Okay, Herbie. My grandfather was Joseph. Okay. Uh, his... Joseph was his son. Okay. That was Israel, Joseph, Herbie, Herbie and then myself. Okay. Huh. Now, starting uh, the farm when it first started with uh, Charles there, we're talking uh, 18, uh, early 18s. Was it not too big? He had to take deforest it? He had to, to make it? As far as I know, that's, that's the people who, yeah. who made the land because we cannot find any deeds or anybody else who was living on that land before... Uh, Charles. Charles, yes. And Charles came from... The, the Frenchville settlement, and they uh, apparently they canoed, they didn't motor because there was no motor then, <laughs> and they canoed up the river in St. John. Oh. And uh, up until lately, there still was a bouchard. That's where they established, the right first. next to the golf course. The first one. The first bouchard that came in. Before they came in here, okay. they established themselves by the airport, by the uh, golf course. Oh, yeah. Well, from the golf course, they 
be spread out. Yeah. And uh, Charles came up here with Israel. Okay. So this is why the Charles and Israel. We now, uh, when you when you came up here, when you you had to make the land, you had to cut the woods and. Oh, uh, definitely. People, yes. uh, what kind of equipment did they have? We oh, jeez, they had oxen. Oxen, yeah. Uh, very crude equipment. I've seen this type of equipment. I never really worked with that, but uh, I've worked with my father clearing land, and I know, I know how extensive the work is to clear land. Okay, let's uh, let's talk about that for a while. When you cleared land with uh, horses? Oh yes, all we had was horses then. But you had saws and axes, uh, axes. but uh, in the old days uh, they probably didn't even have a saw, they probably we had an axe. Never, they never had a saw yet. It was all... But when, it, when my father, and I remember my father clearing land, and I was maybe seven, eight, ten years old then, and he had a, a two-hand, two-man cross cut saw. Okay. And that was available with an axe. That's about it as far as cutting down trees. Well, when you cut a tree that was too big for to the horses to pull it off the, the ground, then you'd have to dynamite the, uh, the, the stump. And you'd either go underneath and put a stick of dynamite underneath there and split it open. Once it was split open, then the team of horses would hook on to one root, take it out, <laughs> another root, and take it out. How old the boys? <laughs> I'm sure it, it, it must have been maybe uh, a week to take care of a tree that was two feet in diameter. Holy, holy crap. To take it out. One tree. One tree. Yeah. I so it, it's a tremendous a lot of work to... Yeah, in those days. Yes. Now, I read a book about uh, Blue River, Les Gauvins, though. Now, the Gauvins, you must have known them. They lived in Daigle, though. Yeah. It paid a, a Gus Gauvin. Ouais, ouais, ouais. Pour comment ça s'appelait, là. Yeah. But anyway, the, the, uh, the lady, the mother of all those Gauvins who uh, lived in Blue River, talked about his uh, her father, and they couldn't even take the uh, the uh, stumps out because that was before dynamite, I imagine. Yeah. So they they grew uh, grain around the stump. Yeah. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's how the, that's the way we cleared the land. We cut the big trees and pulled the stumps, those that we could pull out. Yeah. And then you scrape the the, the 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 dirt itself. You couldn't plow. You just have a, a tooth harrow that you could pull between the. Uh, the uh, the trees and the stumps and whatever and then you would plant buckwheat in there and buckwheat is a type of grain that will kill all other weeds really so uh, the residues of trees could not grow because it could cho the buckwheat would choke the uh, is that right so inside of uh, two or three years you would have a land that would pretty well cleared of shrubberies. Now, in your day when you did it, you had dynamite and you finally did, uh, yes. but still yes. uh, there was a lot of roots to, left in there. And oh yes, oh definitely. As, as I say, all the roots had to be pulled out. Yeah. And then they had to be dragged to another place out, out of the field. What did you do with all that wood in those days? Did you burn? Some some people said that you had to burn. There was no place uh, to go with it. Or did it have sawmills all over? No, no. Well, we had sawmills. The big wood you used for for uh, lumber. But the trash wood, yeah. the trunk of the trees, uh, whatever, you hauled them into a, a dump somewhere, and sometimes you'd burn them. Sometimes you'd put a, a pile in, in the middle of the field and set fire to it. Oh, yeah. Uh, now, you, you saw oxen working. 
I didn't see oxen. Oh, you didn't see oxen. I didn't see. It oxen. was horses in your day. Yes. Okay. Yes. Did you did you ever see anybody with oxen? Were you? The, uh, I know that's yes, how. Yes, I have seen oxen before. I have seen hooked on before, but I've never seen them really do a tremendous amount of work. Yeah. In the fields. Because it's much slower than a. Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. And then. Uh, so uh, when you uh, you were on the farm with your dad, Arabic, yes, yes, uh, we're talking about horses then. Yes, yes. Mostly. Yes. Mostly horses. Yes. Yeah. And practically every farmer had uh, two, three teams of horses. I remember we had two teams of horses. Were they for specific things? One was for something and one for well, the other? Well, uh, not really, but uh, sometimes you need uh, two types of uh, uh, machinery to haul in the field. Okay. So you'd have one team would do one thing and the other team would do, would do uh, another specific uh, yeah. work. So everybody had uh, barns and uh, oh, these, yes. these etab, the uh, animals of all kinds. Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. When you were a kid growing up, though, what kind of animals did you have on the farm? Oh, we had uh, we had quite a lot of cows. We had, uh, and I, I remember having sheep. Oh yeah. I remember having sheep and uh, chickens, chickens, hogs, pigs. pigs yeah. Uh, our cattle were mostly for milking. We had milk cows, and uh, we'd uh, separate the milk and make butter. And remember, my mother would sell butter, and uh, you know, it's, it was hard times. Yeah, and, and, uh, everybody had to pitch in and and work. Now the farm, going back to the originals, though. Know, they started from the Fish River, which is about how much, how far is it from your house here? About a mile? Oh, yeah. Some fields are not, um, some fields are just a few hundred feet from the, from from the river. Yeah. And so they, uh, they grew this way and right and left. How, how, how big was the farm when your father had it, let's say in acres? My father, when he, when he started farming, he had about a hundred and, I think it's 110 acres when he had. That was a big farm in those days. Uh, yeah, it was a fairly big farm. That was in the 20s. Oh, yeah. 1925, maybe, something like that. Because I know in Santa Gata, there are a lot of, everybody was a farmer in Santa yeah. Gata, where I'm from. Yeah. And uh, a lot of them had 50 acres and, and even less. Oh, definitely, definitely. You, you take all this, the land that I own, 90% uh, of that land belonged to the Bouchards. But my grandfather himself owned 180 acres. Now I own it. But his, his brothers had maybe 40 acres. Yeah. Uh, I, I knew that one had a, a strip of land maybe 300 feet wide that would go clear down to the river. This is the way that they yeah. separated their land, you know. Yeah. So uh, now this, all this land that uh, the Bouchards own around the family here, I own it. You just bought them out uh, as time went on. Yes, and, yes. Uh, they either so left the farm or they sold it to somebody else, and uh, yeah. Then eventually, I, eventually, I got a hold of it. Yeah. Uh, so let's say when you were in your twenties and you started your family and everything like that, there were a lot of farmers here. Oh, gee whiz! I would say in the. Fort Kent area, you would have, uh, I would dare say you would have uh, Fort Kent proper, you would have 60 to 65 farmers, bona fide farmers. Wow. I remember when they had, 
four or five tractor dealers. Huh? Can you name the companies that were selling tractors? John Deere is one. John Deere was one. Ford was another one. Uh, the Massey Harris was one. Oliver was one. Oliver. Oliver. It's Harry Eskivich was selling Olivers. Is Jay that right? Uh, there was cock shots. Ah, what? Cock shots. What's that? Cock shot is uh, a company. Uh, Massey Harris version. Oh, okay. Massey Harris. Too. Massey, yeah. Yeah, cock shot. That was sold by uh, Fudge Nogagnon on uh, Rustic Road. Really? Yeah. Uh, B. Gagnon was selling the Fords. Uh, International Harvester was P. V. Roy. International Royce? Harvester. Uh, P. V. Roy. So? P. V. Roy and his. I, I would. I would think. I don't remember anybody else that sold sold uh, har uh, farm alls. Farm all, yeah. Yeah, besides uh, besides P. V. Roy. Far farm all, P. International Harvester. I'm a favorite. The same thing. Same yes. thing. Then there was uh, uh, John Deere. John Deere. Uh, Associate yes. Frank Martin and Sons. Yes. And then there was J.I. Case, wasn't it? Guimont. Who? J.I. Case, wasn't that a comp... Uh... Case? I don't remember any case that was sold in Fort Kent. I know there was uh, a dealership in Caribou that was selling the Case tractor. Okay. So you had a half a dozen tractor dealers. Oh, yes, and more. I, I really think that there was nine. I can't mention them all, but... Uh, can you imagine that? I nine. think there was nine then. And now where do you go if you want to buy a tractor? Not in Fort Kent. No, not in Fort Kent. You have a few, one in Caribou, and you've got one in Presque Isle. There's two in Presque Isle. There's International Harvester and John Deere in Presque Isle. And then there's, uh, in Caribou, there's... Uh, uh, Crown Equipment, who sells Ford, and uh, they sell uh, New Holland, and they sell Massa Harris, too. Is that right? Uh, but if you want a particular, particular tractor, if they're still in business, you have to order it. <laughs> hey, you talk about changing, you know? Uh, like I was going to interview the last barber in Fort Kent there used to be 11 barbers in Fort Kent, mm -hmm. and he's left alone. Used to be, you say, nine tractor dealers in Fort Kent, down to zero. Right. And 65 right. farmers down to what now? What do you think? Uh, I think Fort Kent proper has uh, five now. Five from five. 65. Holy yes. boys. And your son is one of them. Uh, yes. Yes. Now, if we go back to when you were clearing land, uh, which where was that land? Uh, around right around here. It was right in, in the back of the house that uh, my son owns now. There was the four-acre field there that uh, I remember that uh, my father cleared. And it would take that long. Oh well, yes, yes, yes. Dynamite. Something yeah, dangerous. Yeah, I remember dynamiting a rocks. You'd have to dynamite rocks. Big rocks. Huh? Yes, yes. So what would happen? They'd split. They'd split. The oh yeah, they split. My father was uh, quite a uh, a guy to uh, know how to use dynamite. He'd uh, drill a little hole in the middle of the rock, and he'd take some mud. And he'd put a, 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 a piece of dynamite on the rock in that hole, and then he'd pack it with, with, uh, with dirt, water and dirt. When it blew, it split the top of the rock off. And sometimes you'd have to maybe dynamite it four or five times. <laughs> That's why you were just saying about... Uh, going into Canada, and you don't have to go to Canada, you can stay in the United States and have some uh, nice piece of property, nice land, w with uh, a little clump of trees here, a little clump of trees there, 
this is where uh, they couldn't dynamite the, the rock. So they piled all the thrash in there. So it, it makes a little island in the middle of a, in the middle of a field. You well, go to Canada and you see a lot of them. Well, on all the farms around here, you had rock piles. Oh yes, yes. But uh, and uh, well, you see a clump of trees or. Uh, well, we, uh, around here, uh, I've seen a lot of rock piles, but they were put on the edge of the fields. Yeah. So you don't see too many in the middle of a field. But some places they... Oh, some places they are. Yeah. Some places they are. They couldn't uh, get rid of them. Well, it take, would take too much time, too, too much work to uh, eliminate that. So how long did your father farm? Oh, my father farmed. He, he retired. He was uh, in his... Uh, Oh, he was in his uh, late 60s. He had a little problem, a little heart problem. And he retired in his late, he was late 60s when he retired. Did they have a big family, your parents? My parents had five children. Now, everybody else uh, scattered and you stayed with the farm? Is that how it happened? Uh, of my siblings? Yeah. My, uh, my sister, all I had was sisters. Oh, yeah. Oh, I had I four sisters and I was the only boy. Oh, okay. Uh, so you inherited the farm? Uh, well, yes, I was more or less stuck with the farm. <laughs> <laughs> what year are we talking about when you took over? Oh, I was talking, I'm talking about the late 40s. Late 40s. Late 40s. And uh, how much, how much uh, potato f acres did you have at the time? Oh, at the time, uh, my father would usually put in maybe 140, 150 acres. Which was a big farmer. Which was a big farm, yes. All around this area here? Yes, yes. And, uh, and uh, you, you had some good years there. Oh, definitely, definitely. I, I'm not saying that farm, uh, I, I, I like farming. If it would, would be to start again, maybe I'd do the same thing. Uh, now it's a lot harder to farm. It's real, real hard to put make ends meet today. Well, if we look at uh, the machinery, you know, I go by uh, Pelzi Farms there in uh, Frenchville, yeah, and look at their tractors and stuff yeah. that's in the holy crap! Come on, a good tractor, see? Huh? Well, a tractor is anywhere between a hundred and a hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a tractor. For a tractor. <laughs> Do you remember how much you paid for the for the first one you bought? First one we bought, we paid nine hundred and forty dollars, and we had the plow with that. <laughs> nine hundred bucks. That was in nineteen forty. Two. When your father was still yes. farming. Yeah. Nine hundred bucks. Yes. Yes. Me last year was the air conditioned yet so the fair me still. Well, uh, what an investment. I can. From there to now. Five years ago, we bought a a combine. It's a fairly nice combine. We get some. They got some nice bigger one combines now, but it's all a, a push button affair. Yeah. Last year, my son didn't want me to drive the combine, but I felt good and I said, Joe, let me drive the combine for another year at least. I'll try it if I can't do it. Well, lo and behold, I cut over 800 acres of grain last year with that combine. It's not hard to run, and uh, we had a trouble-free year, which is very unusual, but we had a trouble-free year as far as combining. So uh, I put in over 800 acres of grain that I cut. Wow. And you enjoyed it? I enjoyed it, yes. 
And you get used to the new technology? Uh, yes, yes, yes. It's a lot better than running a computer. <laughs> I, I haven't mastered that yet. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, you're in the same boat that I am. Now, uh, so if today you would say uh, a guy comes out of high school or college and he says, I want to be a farmer, and he's got nothing to start with, we're talking millions of dollars of investment here. No way you can, no way you can become a farmer it's today. It's impossible. It's impossible. First of all, you have to buy the land. Yes. You yes. have to have a home. Even, even passing it on to your sons today, it's awful hard to do that. It's awful hard to pass it on to your son today because of the taxes involved and things like that. If you don't do it in a, on the long run, uh, it's impossible for him to buy the farm, even if you give the farm away. Really? Because he's going he's to pay taxes. It's horrible, huh? No, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's probably impossible. So what do you think that is? Is it the big companies that are trying to kill the well, family farm? Well, it's bureaucracy. Yeah. I worked quite a few years for the Department of Agriculture in, in the, uh, uh, they called it the ASCS then, but it was a, uh, an agency that uh, the uh, government could use that agency to help farmers okay. put diversions on the land or, uh, you know, help the farmers and help establish young farmers. Uh, and I had, a, we've had, had quite a bit of experience in many farmers here in the, in the uh, Rutter County that we tried to establish their sons into farming. And the government wouldn't let us do that because of the fact that they didn't earn the farm. They had to earn the farm before they be established as a bona fide farmer so he could get some kind of a help to oh. whatever subsidies that we that we have had or disasters. So it, it, it was awful hard and, and like we tried uh, awful hard. But like when your father transferred the farm to you, that was a lot easier then. Oh yes, oh definitely. Definitely. You just say, I'm giving this to my son. That's right, for a dollar. For a dollar. Yes. That's it. And that, that, went, that went through. I lost waste. Yes. <laughs> yes. You, maybe if there would have been thousands and thousands of acres, maybe it would have been different then. Yeah, yeah. But uh, when it was only four or five hundred acres or two or three hundred acres, uh, they wouldn't bother with that. And it's not getting any better. Oh, definitely not. Uh, this That's year we had a very good price in, in, in potatoes. Really? A, a very good price, a price that I have never seen. But uh, that was for potatoes who were not under contract. Okay. And today, in the past 10, 15 years, if you were to survive, you had to grow potatoes under contract. Because you had a certain price for your potatoes, you knew what you were going to get before you plant your potatoes. Which is a good thing. Which is a good thing. And uh, we don't have, uh, especially in the valley here, we have no place where to go with our potatoes except we go to McCain and Easton. And McCain it would, it, in Easton is too far away, which is not. Yeah, compete. freight is is uh, too big a problem to have contracts with e with the, these people. McCain's about sixty miles. Uh, McCain is uh, a good seventy miles. From seventy here. miles, yeah. Well, seventy and seventy, that's hundred and forty. Yeah. So the guy from Presque Isle in Mars Hill, he can go to McCain. They, they they had no problem because they can go with open trucks and go, travel twenty miles, and they're at the plant. Yeah. Uh, this year. They're crying. They're crying bloody murder this year 
because all their, con their potatoes were contracted and the others that? that didn't have contracts were making a mint in potatoes. While these were going down because of the price of fertilizer, the price of fuel. When you pay fuel $5 a gallon and fertilizer eight, nine, $900 a ton, and the spray material is gone right through the roof. So a lot of these farmers have lost a lot of money. In fact, we've got the, quite a few farmers who are calling it quits this year. In fact, we do have a, an auction going on in Santa Gat only next week. Really? Yes, for a farmer that's, that's quitting. And I've heard that uh, quite a few uh, McCain growers are quitting besides that. So uh, when did this start, this, uh, this contracting? Before that, you, you grew potatoes and you stored them and you gambled all year. Uh, uh, that's right, yeah. Uh, then you had the, some years you could make a buck, make a few dollars. Some years we would lose a few dollars, but it, it wasn't like this. Today, you can lose anywhere between, uh, and I'm talking a small farmer now, I'm talking about 150 to 200 acres, which is a small farm today. You can lose anywhere between two and three hundred thousand dollars. Two hundred thousand dollars and three hundred thousand dollars, you cannot find that in the diversion ditch in the farm every year. So uh, you can't you can't do that too often. You can't do that too often. And what's uh, supporting? You? What's uh, what's to back you up if you're a farmer today? Is there the government going to help you? Let's say like they had floods there. Uh, I know I, I read in the paper where Long's fertilizer or Long's farms in Clare. The only farmer left in Clare is. Yes is quitting this year. Yes. And they blame it on the floods because the, they had a tremendous amount of water over there. And another farmer, the only one in, left in St. Francis, New Brunswick, same thing, he's quitting. Because the government didn't help him when they had this disaster, I guess. Uh, uh, I think that you have to attribute more than flooding to the demise of these uh, premises that you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, I know I've talked uh, quite lengthy with uh, with Yvonne Lain, which was uh, long fertilizer and potato growers, and I've talked lengthy with his son too. And uh, these guys were were trustable people, and they trusted every farmer, and uh, they couldn't collect from the farmer. So if they can't collect from the farmers, how can they survive? And I think that 90% of the problem between long uh, fertilizer it's, is the creditors that put him out of business. I know last year he, was, he came home and he was talking with Joe and he said, he said, you know, he says, I just come back from a farmer up your way here. And he said, uh, he owes me $800,000. Holy jeez. Small farmer. <laughs> and he said, uh, geez, you know, I'd like to get a little, uh, I'll do the best I can. I'll do the best I can. Right now, this year, I can't do it. Uh, well, he said, anytime you can, you try and do it. In the meantime, his wife drives up with a $50,000 uh, pickup truck. <laughs> brand new plates on it. So this is the, this is the problem that uh, we have. Now this uh, for, uh, long fertilizer, they're sold across the river here. Yes, they sold a lot of fertilizer up, uh, up here yes. in, in this area. So yes. they had a lot of customers and oh yes, and then they sold them and say I'll pay you later, and they didn't. Huh? They couldn't. Or, well, that's or, or they said they couldn't. That's that's exactly <laughs> right, and, and and most of the time it was legit. You know, Why? They, you just couldn't couldn't pay them. Now, how does a farmer go from owing that much money? How does he farm the next year? You know what I mean? He well, where does he borrow? 
you've heard about uh, all these uh, city banks, these big banks that we're having problem with. Yeah. We have the same problem here, you know. If some banks are stuck with a farmer, and uh, they'll say, well, we'll let you go again another year, see what we can do about it, you yeah, know. Yeah. They keep him a better tab on him, but we'll let you have some more monies. They go until they're all done. When the, these farmers don't have any more equity, the bank, the bank uh, stops it, and foreclosures or... The, ba the bank is stuck too. And uh, sometimes the bank is stuck, yes. Yeah. And they, they go to auctions. The bank gets what the auction gives them. That's about it. <laughs> Which is not... Uh... No, 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 no. No, no. It's, it, it, it's not nice farming anymore. Yeah. Well, I was uh, reading the other day where our milk, for instance, you know, in the uh, fast food stores, uh, restaurants, comes from Wisconsin, comes from California, comes from all over the place, and the dairy farmers in Maine are, are falling uh, by the wayside. That's why right. not use our own milk? Why, That's right. That's why right. travel milk from California? And the same with potatoes here. We, we had to fight, I think, McDonald's to use our own potatoes, right? Right. That's a few right. years ago. But don't, you, don't forget that the shirt you're wearing now comes from China. Oh, absolutely. I haven't seen the label, but I'm sure it comes from I'm China. I'm sure it does, yeah. Almost everything you buy. It's very tough on... on so, uh, on we've got problems in this world. Oh, yeah. We've got big problems with this world. Yeah. Big problems with, uh, in our country. Yes, yes. Because, you know, uh, you and I were brought up with Fraser in Madawaska. Yeah. And who would have ever imagined that Fraser would be on the verge of, we don't know. You're right. It's You're day right. to day. And if Fraser would ever let go, changing the subject a little, but if Fraser would ever let go, what kind of damage this would do to the St. John Valley? Absolutely. Tremendous amount of damage. Tremendous. There's quite a few men uh, from Fort Kent who work there. Oh, yes. And uh, probably little towns like Fringel and Santa Gat, a yes. lot of men work yes. there. Yes, yes. And uh, the lumber industry is just about... Uh, just about gone, the lumber. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so it's... all the natural resources up here is gone. Yeah. The farmers are gone, practically. Uh, the lumber is gone. So this is, this is our natural resources. This is the type of resources that we were brought up with and we made a living with, brought up our children, our grandchildren. And Things used to be a lot nicer. Oh, well, definitely. Because definitely. I think well, most of us were thinking of growing, of getting better of uh, you know a farmer would say if I can buy my neighbor's farm I'm gonna and then you always thought you would you'd improve yes and now you're just trying to hold on <clears throat> to what you have in any type of business you need friends you need farmers to help farmers and when your farmer next door farmer leaves who are you gonna Try, try for help. Because that was the, the way of life. That was the way of life. If, uh, if a farmer had trouble, they would all help him. Let's say that you had to get your crop in because you didn't start early enough or whatever. The others would all pitch in. And you know, I remember way back in, in my days, in my farming days, that uh, something happens, uh, sickness or machine would break down, some, some farmers. The next thing you knew, everybody was out there to help him out. I had some farmers come and help me myself. In the year that was pretty muddy. Yeah. And I couldn't get all my crop in. I had some farmers coming in with their machinery to help me. No, you don't see that anymore. Well, there's hardly any left. Well, there's hardly any left, that's true. 
That's true. So you took, did you say you took, you took the farm in 48, 1948? Your yeah, just farm? about 1940. Well, really, I, I took it over yeah, in 48. Then I did the stitch in the, in the service. And, uh, you didn't go to Korea, did you? I was in the Korean War, yeah. You were? Yeah. Wow. So uh, when I came back, uh, I really jumped in both feet in farming. Well, tell me a little bit about Korea as we go by here. Did well, you, did it, you? It, it wasn't really a big stitch in Korea. I was there, uh, uh, I left here in November of uh, 49. Okay. And then uh, when did the I war came back in 1951. Well, you, you were there when the war was on. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. I was there when the war was on. But I, I, I never crossed, I, I never went overseas. Oh, I see. I never went overseas. I trained, uh, trained in the United States and I helped train somebody else. And, Okay, so you were not in the war itself. No, but I you, was not overseas. I, I was not. Uh, you were in the service at that time. Yes, I was in the service. Did you go to Europe or did you travel or you stayed no, here? No, I went from Georgia. I took my basic in Georgia, and then we went to California, and uh, that's where we ended up. So you came back in '51. Was the yes. war over? When? How long? No, no, the war. I think the war lasted three or four years, yeah. if I remember right. I think it's 53 when... Yeah, and they had a truce there. Yeah. And it's yeah. still the same truce. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Almost 60 years later. Still the same problem. So uh, who took care of the farm when you were gone? Your father was still... My father was still active. He's still good to enough. to take care yeah. of the farm, yes. Yeah. Now, I don't think I've ever met the, your parents. So when did they pass away? My father passed away in 1965. Oh, okay. 1965. I came to Fort Kent in 63, so. Yeah. And your mother, was, did she, was she long? My father, life? my mother, when she was 85, I think my mother went. You remember her, Dito? 76? How old she was? My mother died. She died, she was 82, 82 or 81, yeah. In what year, in 82? Um, Just about 82. Yeah. Probably, yeah. Yeah. So you, uh, you come back from the war, it, it, it's Mariela? No, no, we got married. Uh, I got married as soon as I came back. So Rita, what's her, what's her last name? Her last name is Emisho. Michel. Michel. From Fort Kent? Yeah. Yeah. You were going out uh, together before you left for the war? Uh, yes, we knew each other. Yeah. Did you graduate from high school here? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Graduated in 44. So, you get married in the mid 50s? The early 50s, 52, I think, we get yeah. married. Yeah. yeah. How big a family did you have? We have six children. Six children. We have uh, five girls and one boy. So just like your dad, huh? Yeah, yeah. Four girls and a boy, and you did the same thing. Isn't yeah. that something? Well, we had five girls and a boy. Yeah. And the boy was the last one. Oh, is that right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we tried. <laughs> <laughs> you finally did it, huh? Yeah, yeah. So uh, your, your uh, wife is... A farm a wife, she helps you with the farm all the time. Oh, yes. Oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, if I wouldn't have had the wife and the children, uh, I, I don't think that maybe we would have survived the farm. Because I happened to be in the... I tried every aspect of farming in my lifetime. Uh, I, I've tried turkeys. Uh, I've tried... Uh, I had laying hens, and uh, sold the a, eggs. I put a house with thirteen thousand layers in that in that house, and we've picked uh, up to, 
I know some days that we picked well over a thousand eggs a day. <laughs> so we needed somebody to uh, no, 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 handle no. these eggs, to wash these eggs, and to pack them. And now we're talking hand hand. It's not automatic in those days. It was pretty well automatic, though. Really? What year are you talking about when I'm you had eggs? I'm talking about 63. Started in 63. And I grew my own replacements. So it, it was uh, quite a bit of work. But then the girls, uh, my oldest girls, would uh, help tremendously. After school, they'd go in there and they'd grade the eggs. And uh, you'd sell them to who? Oh, I'd sell them mostly locally really? to the wood operation. The wood operation was a tremendous amount of uh, business then. They'd come in, uh, and there was quite a bit of operation in the woods. Yeah. They'd come in with uh, five, six cases of eggs uh, a week, and if you'd had uh, 10 or 15 operators, that was uh, quite a bit of, of eggs, you know. So what's consume. a case of eggs? How big was that? A, a, a case of eggs, how many eggs? 30 dozens. So a case is 30 dozens. 30 dozens a case, yes. So we're talking here 400 eggs per case, huh? Am I right, Lamar? Uh, Three times, yeah. Yeah. 400 eggs about per case, and they'd buy five or six cases? Oh, yes. And, oh, and, yes. and there were a lot of them, a lot of operators. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sure maybe we, I sold to maybe 10 or 15 operators from Ashland to Allagash. And, uh, when you have a, a, a wood operation that they, they feed uh, 40 to 60 men, that yeah. consumes a lot of eggs. Holy gee, yeah. So, oh, yeah, yeah. They just don't eat one apiece. So. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, isn't that something? Now, you, you, okay, let's go. Just go back to you. Come out of the war, no? and uh, how many? What was your father doing? Was it just potatoes? You had some grain. Was it? Uh, he had uh, very little grain. What's grain? Is it oats? Well, it, it was mostly uh, oats. He grew he grew buckwheat just for himself or uh, yeah for the family. Every year we'd grow buckwheat for the for the family. You didn't sell any at that time to the uh, neighbors. No, no, no. because no. everybody had uh, yeah had uh, a, a pack of buckwheat. Yeah, and we had maybe I can see three or four mills in the vicinity. Uh, Grace mill, you know. Now there's none. Yeah, none at all. And he grew a little oats and potatoes. As I say, he had some cows and a few pigs, few chickens. That's what you came into. He made hay, and so this this is what I came into. Here we are, Alvin. You're coming back from the war, and your father has uh, how many acres did you say? Oh, he had uh, at that time. He was farming maybe 120 acres. Mostly potatoes. Mostly potatoes. Yeah, yes. just a little bit of grain. Yeah. Just a little bit of grain and cattle. And so you've got all these animals too, and your kids, you don't have any kids yet, là. Faut tu commences une famille, là? Uh, yes, yes, yes. So uh, at first you were alone with, uh, you must have had some help, you had helpers, uh, people you hired? Well, I've always had a helper on the farm. When the father left, he, I always had a full-time man. Okay. A full-time man. And uh, sometimes you'd have to hire maybe two or three more, but... Uh, they had a lot of people in those days that, uh, in French, uh, you would call them un journalier. Uh -huh. He would work from day to day, and some, yeah. some days he wouldn't work. And yeah. So you had a lot of people available like that. Yeah. Well, uh, yes, and you had a lot of people who wanted to work, too. Yeah. So you could call up somebody and say, hey, I need you for the next four days or something. Uh, yes, that, that was a little harder. Oh? But I, I, I think that the, uh, 
easiest uh, leverage you could find was to have a steady man. Yeah. Then if you'd have a steady man, then you'd have, you'd have no problem. Of now, in the, in the 1950s, though, when you started the farm, though, yeah. everything was done by hand, the, the uh, harvesting, right? Yes. This is before harvesters. Oh, yes, yes. So you had uh, tractors. Yes. Oh, horses were... Horses were gone. Gone. Horses and uh, so how would you harvest in the in the fall? You had more than one tractor, I imagine, or...? Oh, no, we had... Uh, I always had two or three tractors. Uh, harvesting was a, a big job then because you'd have to have barrels and uh, yeah. you, you'd need a, a whole army of people. Yeah. I remember the last year I harvested. I had, uh, I think I had put in 240 acres of potatoes then that year. And uh, my harvest crew was 85 pickers. I had 85 people picking by hand. Wow. Besides the truckers, laborers, truckers, and the potato house people. And, uh, so uh, when you'd uh, harvest uh, between 2,000 and 2,500 barrels of uh, potatoes a day, uh, these tickets had to be counted because every barrel had one ticket. 2,500 tickets. 20, so you'd have 2,500 tickets. And sometimes it wouldn't come in before uh, uh, 9, 10 o'clock at night. By the time the potatoes were all in and the fields were clean. So the wife was the one who counted the tickets that night. Sometimes they, they'd count tickets till 11, 12 o'clock at night. Now this tickets to stuff, I, I picked potatoes a little bit, that was not very good, but there must have had a, a, quite a bit of trust there between the picker and, and the counter. You know what I mean? If you pick 75 barrels a day, uh, how often did they make mistakes, do you think? I was pretty lucky. I've had a few, I've had a few discrepancies. But not that many. You Maybe mean, four or five barrels yeah. at the most. You mean somebody would come up to you and say, listen, I picked more than yes. that. Yeah. Yes. But uh, you know these people because these people who want to put up a fuss like that, they come in often. If one comes out of a blue mood to say, hey, I've got five barrels that I'm missing of, of yesterday that I have don't have tickets for, not accounted for, well, you have no problem. You give them the five tickets and yeah. you clean it up. But those that come in uh, every two days, yeah. that's a different story. Yeah. Now you know there's a little fraud in there. Yeah. Um, how much did you pay per barrel uh, to pick in, in the first oh. years? I don't remember. I think the last time that I... I think it was something like uh, 13 or 14 cents a barrel. Early 50s? No, it, that was in the 60s. Okay. That was in the late 50s, Probably, early 60s. It seems to me I picked for 5 and 6 cents a barrel. Is that possible in the Oh, 50s? yes. Oh, yes. I remember uh, a penny and a half. Penny and a half. A penny and a half when my father used to pick potatoes. <laughs> he had pickers. Ten and a half. Wow. I started out with uh, seven cents a barrel. When you were farming? Yeah, when I started uh, yeah. on my own. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Seven cents a barrel. If you picked a hundred, you had seven dollars. Seven dollars. Which was a good Seven dollars a day was a good day's work yeah. in, the, in the 50s. Oh, yeah. I think my father, see, he had a building material store in Santa Gat. Yeah. He had a full-time uh, helper, though. Yeah. 35 bucks a week. Yes. And uh, I think he worked close to 60 hours. You know, seven to nine. Oh, yes. That's 14 hours a day. Yeah. 
Oh yes. And yeah, uh, that was that was the going wages then. And Saturday you know, was uh, was like a regular day, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah. Still seven oh, to yes. nine. Yeah. So seven cents a barrel was. Uh, how about when you the last time you paid uh, by the barrel? Was that thirteen cents then? Is I that? think it was around thirteen or fourteen cents. Yeah. Then. And then, then, uh, then we went to harvesters. Yeah. Which year was that? Harvesters. That was 1960. Went into harvesters 1964. Right from when they came out. Yes. Started right yes. away. In fact, that was the first harvester that uh, came into the valley here. Is that right? Yeah. Now, who was selling that? Farmall International. Uh, I had it uh, from uh, a company out of Mars Hill. The company, the company's name was Wassa. Okay. They they were selling dolmens. That that was a mounted harvester. You would take a tractor, take the wheels off, and put your tractor on the harvester, and the tractor would the motor of the tractor would pull the harvester and turn it. So you took the wheels off your tractor. Yes. Yes. That was a big job. That yeah, you take the rear wheels and the front end of the tractor, and you mount it on a harvester, which was about maybe oh, five, right. six feet from the ground, maybe ten feet from the ground. Right on the harvester. Right on the harvester. Oh, damn. Bolted on the harvester. Is that? And the something? axles, you would had chains that would hook on to the axle that would pull the the harvester. Isn't that something? I've never. I don't remember that. Oh, yeah, I've had it a long time. Really? I've had it a long time. Now it seems to be, how, how does it work today? Is it in back of the tractor or yeah. the side of it? It's pulled by the tractor. It's pulled? Yeah. Now when, that, when did that change? Oh, maybe five or six years later, maybe seven years later. They started to have pull type uh, harvesters. Around 1970. Yeah, just about the 70s, yeah. Now, what kind of a job was that to put the tractor on the harvester? You, you, what that did, that what was did, a big job. You'd what? have to have a crane to uh, lift up your tractor and then you'd drop it on the harvester. That was a, I would say, a, a good day's job with three or four men. Wow. Three or four men, a good day job. And how good was it? Did you have a lot of trouble with that stuff? Never had too much trouble with mine. I, 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 as far as I, I can tell, that was one of my best harvesters. Really? You would think some, something new like that would fall apart, would, uh, wouldn't work? No, no, I never had any problem. It was a little slower than what we have today. Yeah. But... Uh, it was, uh, I cannot say it was bruise free, but uh, bruises were at a very minimum. Just as good as it was, uh, that they are today. Is that right? Yeah. Now, did you have just one of those? Yes, I had just one. Yeah. Now, let's go back a little bit some more because uh, this is potato country and. Uh, uh, throughout our lives, uh, potatoes uh, was all a part of our lives. Everybody who lived here. Yes. Where did you get your 85 pickers when you had them at first there? Canada? All from around here. Yeah? All from around here. Uh, I had bonds from Canada, yes. I would, uh, maybe every year I'd... Uh, Hire maybe 10 or 12 from Canada, mostly from around the uh, uh, Clare area, so they'd uh, commute back and forth okay. morning and night. So you didn't have to house, I didn't have to uh, feed them and house feed them. them and, uh, and, uh, house them. Because we hear a lot about people like uh, Gerard Plut, they would take, he would like, what was he, uh, not a foreman or a jobber or something? He was a jobber. And he would take them to Fort Fairfield, whole yes. families from Canada. Oh, yes. And he'd yeah. had to feed them and house them, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. But the farmer was uh, 
supplying the uh, the buildings. Right, to take care of these people. To take care of these people. So. Now I remember Santa got there and uh, potato harvest time was like uh, triple the population. Uh, oh, I would say that, yes. And I remember that in Madawaska alone, I might be wrong with my figures here, but 20,000 Canadians came over to pick potatoes. Yes. Just at the just at the Madawaska port of entry. Yeah, that's a possibility. Yes. Probably yes. the same here and. Yeah. Yeah. You know. See, I'd have a more or less a, a little van or a little bus that I'd pick up my harvesters, go around town and pick up a crew of my harvesters and bring them in in the morning, bring them back at night. So that was. Part of my crew was like that. Most of them came by by themselves. With uh, their own most cars. of them came by themselves. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, in those days, the potato harvest vacation from school was a real thing. There, they had. The, oh yes! Oh yes! Uh, we definitely needed these kids. You needed them. Yes. Yes. A lot more than what we do need now. Yeah. And we're talking two weeks, three weeks. Oh, we're talking four weeks then. Really? Oh yes. Four and four and five weeks. I've I've spent five weeks during harvest, depending on the weather. Yeah. All the time, the weather was a, a big factor. Oh, well, definitely, it's always a big factor. The weather. But uh, now, kids, they had the, the real vacation for potato harvest. Was it yes. two weeks or yeah. three? They weeks? had three weeks. Three weeks. Three weeks. So, if the thing lasted longer, uh, some of them would s stick around. And if the if the uh, if the harvest was lasted longer, all you had to do is inquire to the or let the principal know that you're not done and you'd like to have these kids a few more days, and they would let you have them. So, uh, potato farming was a big part of our lifestyle here. Uh, it, oh it, yes, yes. Farmers, it was uh, farmers. It was ninety percent. Because if you, the farmer, said we're gonna, uh, these kids are not going to school for another week, uh, and the principal would agree to that, so you. Well, he, I, I don't know if they'd agree with the week, but you'd ask them for two or three days, and they'd let you have that. They'd let they, you do it. Isn't that something, huh? But today you can't do that. No, because it's uh, it's not necessary for one thing. Well, it's not necessary, and I don't think the state would let yeah. you do that because yeah. the state has some money yeah. tied up with the school system. You know. Well, if we go back just one generation, uh, there was no question that if you had work to do, you didn't go to school. When it was harvest time, the kids stayed, and they went to school when there was nothing to do. And well, he, even in the spring, it was the same thing. My father did that. He, yeah. He went to school uh, between harvest and planting, and that was it. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it was a different time, you know. So, uh, so when did uh, do you think that the school system started saying, "Well, uh, we can't do this anymore"? Or we <clears throat> probably when the harvesters came, huh? Well, uh, first off. Uh you had a few uh, parents who wouldn't want their children to go to school, uh, work on the harvesters. Right. They just didn't want their children to work. But there again, they didn't want to have them home. So they started putting up a fuss about their harvest. And then, as I said before, uh, the system in teaching uh, came much more rigid than it was before. Right. Third generation. So with that combined, it was awful hard. I mean, farmers had to put up a good defense to have the children at least two weeks. Up to now, we've 
don't, we haven't had a problem. In the future, you never can tell what the future will bring. So, uh, school break there for Pratera Harvest is still a necessity today? Yes, yes, yes. It's still a necessity. So how, uh, how many people would Joey hire and employ there during harvest time compared to uh, you? You had, a, you had over 100 people. Well, yes, uh, but hey. that was during the, the uh, potato barrel uh, yeah. situation. Uh, now, uh, I think that he can do the same thing with maybe uh, 15 people. The potatoes go from the harvester directly into the truck. Yes. No barrels involved. Nothing at all. Involved. And then you haul that to the storage facility. Yes. And uh, the truck is is equipped to just dump it. To unload it, it's got tracks at the bottom of the of the uh, the hopper box. Okay. And it rolls the potatoes to a, a bin hopper, which the bin hopper would bring it up to the pile. You back up right to the pile with these potato, new potato houses that we have now. So, so now how many people are doing this? I mean, it takes... Well, you need three people at the potato house. Okay. And uh, you need one farmer, one uh, har uh, truck operator yeah. for that truck. But you need at least four trucks. So there's four truck drivers, three at the potato house. Yeah. Harvester, how many people on it? Uh, harvester, you have five people on the harvester, but you have a windrower that has to windrow potatoes in front of the harvester. So that's two tractors that you employ there. Oh, I see. So you, you take two rows and put it in two other rows. So the harvester technically goes in and picks up four rows. A lot of these new harvesters, newer harvesters today, pick up as, as much as eight rows. Wow. Now, what did you call that? The first, the guy, the one that... A windrower. Wind? Windrow. Okay. That, the, the, the machine itself is called a windrower. It takes two rows? It takes the two rows and dumps them into, into the two rows that the harvester's picking. Okay. So the harvester uh, picks up four rows, four rows at, at yes. one shot. So it seems it's like a lot uh, faster now yeah, yeah. than it used to be. Seems to me that uh, that technology has been very good, the harvester. You mean you, you didn't have any trouble with it? No, I never had any problems with and, it. And uh, when they changed the style there from the tractor being put on the harvester to the other kind, yes. ça marchait bien, c'est tout là. Uh, oui, ça marchait bien. Ça marchait bien. Now, what about, uh, you had chickens, you said, how many? Thirteen? I, I, I had 13,000 layers at <laughs> one time. Where was that? Right that by was your... right on the farm, where, oh, really? where uh, Joe's Potato House is now. He converted it into a potato house now. So how many people did you employ there to get this oh, thing going? Your, your kids, were, were they... Besides the family, besides the family, you used to have two or three people. Yeah. Take care of that. Just for the eggs. Yeah. And then feeding the chickens and feeding the chicken. They were fed automatically, but you have to Yeah. You have to bring in the feed. It shows the feed is uh, it took one uh, man just to check the feed and the waterers, you know, every day. Because uh, they now need, they need water and they need feed. Farming and lumbering, which were the big, big things in this area, were about the same time. They were at going big, they were going good at the same time. Yes. You supplied 15 uh, lumber camps. With, with eggs. With yes. eggs. Yes. Now, today you, won't, you wouldn't have one lumber camp. To f you don't have one operator that... Uh, uh, hires people and feeds them in the woods. They all feed themselves when they go to the woods today. <laughs> Talk about a big change. Oh, yes. Oh, definitely. It's, it, it's a big change. So this took, took away your livelihood when the, when the uh, 
Well, uh, I'm sure that uh, you have a lot of uh, chicken houses now. Yeah. That are still operating. But the, up to today, I was selling eggs just as much as they're selling eggs today. It's amazing, isn't it? The price. Yeah. And my feed would cost me anywhere between $1.80 to $3.20 a hundred. Now the feed is around $20 to $25 a hundred. Ten times. So I, I can't see how these people are operating. You can still get a dozen eggs for less than a dollar, I think. You're, you're right. That's you're right. Bon, yeah. yeah. Every time I uh, buy some eggs, uh, I think, how come a dozen eggs? So cheap. Yes, you're right. It's amazing. You're right. So how long did you have that, Alban? I had that 10 years. 10 uh, years. What, what were the years? Uh, 63 to 72. And what made you stop it? Uh, what made me stop is I grew my own replacement. I had a barn that was uh, three stories high, and I grew my replacement. I grew uh, at least 5,000 chickens at a time, you different mean, ages. You mean they hatched, the chickens had chickens? No. Oh, you no, buy, no, you I buy. buy. I buy the day-old chicks. Okay. I buy the day-old chicks and I'd raise them to 13 weeks and then I'd transfer them to the, my, my laying houses. Okay. But one day in October, what happened, I don't know, but Fire came and destroyed my uh, my bre my uh, replacement house. Really? So I had uh, I think it's 4,500 chicks in that house, and they all they all went. Wow! So I said, well, this could be a turning point. And my children were getting older. Uh, my girls were getting to be. 15, 16 years old. They were soon out of high school, going to college. They didn't think that was fun anymore there. Uh. Oh, definitely. And I had a little, well, never had a problem, but. Yeah, it was a lot of work. Yes. So I said, well, maybe as soon as these chickens have uh, laid their, their time, I'm out of it. And that's exactly what I did. Well. Probably that was uh, something good that happened, that fire. Chickens were good to me. Oh, they were, huh? They were very good to me. You did well with that? Yes. Yes. Now, uh, you never raised them for meat? No. No. What happens to a chicken when it's done laying? When it's done laying, they have a processing pl They had a processing plant in... Uh, in Belfast, and I'd load them in crates in in bulk in crates in a truck, and I'd drive them down to Belfast, and they would slaughter them, and that's how it went. That that's how they went. Huh? Now, uh, during all this time, there do you still have animals, other animals at your farm? Oh yes, oh yes, I had uh, cows and. You didn't sell any milk? No, no, no. Uh, the cows that I had, I had uh, beef cattle. Oh, okay. I had beef cattle. And there again, uh, I had uh, not that many beef cattle. I had maybe 30, 35 a head of cattle. And uh, one, uh, one fall, they were still in the field, and they jumped the fence, and they went to my neighbor's, and they light a sprayer and they licked on that goddamn sprayer. <laughs> and uh, before I, uh, the farmer called me up around two o'clock in the morning, he says, your cows are here. So I said, I'll, I'll go and get them. Before I got them, maybe a thousand feet, from that barn, I had 10 that had died. 
Holy crap. That the, this uh, sprayer, you, then you could you, you use the sodium arsenic to spray your potatoes. You, you killed your talks with that. Oh. And uh, it was salty, and the, the cows just loved that. They loved it, And huh? it didn't take much. So I lost 17. So that was the end of my <laughs> beef cattle. Now, when you mention something like this, makes me think of this stuff being sprayed on the potato tops. Yeah. Doesn't that affect the the potato? <laughs> Don't we eat some of that? I've never seen anybody die from that. Now you have to spray potatoes. You have to wear protective clothing. And you have to take a shower every time that you've done spraying. Is it, is it a different, a different kind of chemicals? Well, it might be maybe a lot different kinds of chemical, but you still have to have a license. And every year you have to renew your license. Well, mm. I was spraying. I, I even took the showers in, the, this, in this spray material. Really? Well, it's a hose with, with bust, you know, it's a burst, a, a sprayer, a hose is let go and gets you in the face or gets you anywhere. I'd wipe my face with my hands and keep going. And I'm 82 years old and I'm still not dead. So don't tell me that this stuff is poisonous. It's poisonous for cows. Well, it's poisonous for cows. It's poisonous for people too if you drink it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <clears throat> so when uh, you started uh, farming in '52, was there a lot of spraying? Then when did spraying come into farming? Before that, uh, your grandfather certainly didn't spray anything on his potatoes. Yes, yes. You had then. You had blue vitriol. What it did, I don't know. You. Uh, You'd buy this blue vitriol blue. and you'd soak it in a tub of water and then you'd add lime to it. And that was supposed to keep the fungus from farming on the potatoes. Yeah, plus it's blue. It's blue, yeah. Blue vitriol, yeah. Parce que I remember when I was a kid, my on va aller mettre du bleu. Yeah. And the farmers would, uh, all along Long Lake there, they'd go and clean their... Uh, tanks right in the lake you know they, they'd clean yeah. them out and uh, yeah. that stuff would go in the lake yeah and uh, now I remember some guys coming in our store all yellow on their skin what was that do you know that was a pre-merge and I've had that I, I've had my hair yellow maybe six months out of the year you would kill the tops with that uh, before harvest. Before harvest. And uh, when you would spray potatoes, you know, the spray would get on you and your tractor was all yellow and... Uh, yeah. <laughs> never killed me. Now, throughout all this, you uh, grew some grain, you say, your father had... Yeah. You. When did you start growing more grain? Because uh, all of a sudden, here we have a quite a good business with uh, buckwheat here. Well, uh, I've always used grain. See, when you plant potatoes, you try and have a one-to-one -one rotation. And then the oats was the primary crop to rotate potatoes with. So you grew a year of potatoes and a year of oats? You tried to do that. Some years you wouldn't succeed, but you it's a, it's a good practice to do that. But there's a lot more money in growing potatoes. Uh, yes. So you there was a lot more money so compared you to grain now. Yeah. So you were tempted to grow more potatoes than... than uh, well, uh, not, it, not that you're tempted to grow more potatoes, but uh, sometimes your field does not match to what you should grow in oats and potatoes. So sometimes some fields will have two years of potatoes okay. rather than a year-to-year -year rotation. And that wouldn't hurt anything? Uh, no, it, it would uh, maybe 
Maybe it would bring the yield of potatoes down a little. Okay. Now, hay is something that I always saw uh, back when I was a kid. A lot of hay because they had a lot of animals, right? Yes. They had yes. to feed the cattle yes. and all that. Yes. Uh, so part of your farming uh, acreage was in hay, I imagine. Huh? Yes, yes. And that was a rotation crop as well? It was a rotation crop, but uh, some, some varieties of potatoes don't do well in sod ground. Okay. In hay ground. Okay. So, uh, so you had to know all that stuff. Oh yes. Oh, definitely. If you didn't know it, you you, paid. you learn fast. You paid. Yeah. You learn fast. Uh, did you have a year, or more than one, maybe that was disastrous? Let's say because of the weather or some disease. Oh, definitely, definitely. You take in, I think it's 60, oh, I don't remember just when, in one year in the 60s, one year in the 60s, that was a complete disaster, complete disaster. Because of the weather? You would sell potatoes for, uh, oh, I remember selling potatoes for 25 cents a hundred. Oh. 25 cents a hundred, and you had to put them up. Me, 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 me. In June, I had one house that I uh, emptied in June, and I had a dollar and 25 cents a hundred for them, then, in June. So, you so had, that was a complete disaster. You kept them all year. You had to keep them all year, and uh, then to put up a load of potatoes, a truckload of potatoes or a trailer load of potatoes, uh, you'd need at least uh, 10 men. So the price that you had to pay your men, electricity and, and everything, uh, it, it, uh, the price you had for, for potatoes were just taking care of the labor. <laughs> so that was a disaster. That was a complete disaster. And it was not due to the weather, and just price. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Ah, du bon ça, hein? No, uh, you had good times and you've had bad times. I remember one year in the early 50s where the uh, price of potatoes came up to $5, which was a big amount then. Yeah. And some of the farmers kept, kept them because, oh, it's going to be better in the spring. And it came down to 50 cents. 19, that, that was 1954. I believe it. I remember that year completely. Because I hauled some. A farmer owed, owned, uh, owed my father uh, for uh, building material, and he said, you can take my potatoes, that's all I've got. Mm. And we hauled them to the starch factory. Yeah. Now, starch factories, they, they, they had some all over the place, right? Oh, yes. We had two starch factories in Fort Kent. Frenchville, Santa Gat had them. Yeah. I remember that particular year, 1954. Yeah, that's that, exactly uh, the year. We had, uh, I think that we grew, I was with my father then, I, I think that we grew a little over 10,000 barrels of potatoes. And uh, my father said, uh, we have, we're having a good price this fall. I'm going to sell these, we're going to sell these potatoes. I said, Dad, I said, gee whiz, you know, here we are in October, November, and they were offering us uh, 550 a barrel for potatoes. Come May, they would be worth pretty, pretty high, you know. <laughs> well, he said, that's the way you feel. We'll, uh, we'll let go a few and we'll keep a few. So we, he sold 7,000 barrels. Out of 10. Out of 10. That's smart, don't pay That's smart, son garçon. Come May and June, I'd load 70 barrels of potatoes in, the, in our truck and we'd go down to the Page Start Factory and we'd line up there and it'd take two days to pass that load of potatoes for 50 cents a barrel. Holy, holy car. So that was a lesson that I yeah. learned and I'll remember it for a long time. 
At least you didn't, uh, you did okay, just the same. Well, oh yeah, oh yeah, we did all right, but... Uh, Do you remember if some farmers had gambled their whole crop? Oh, sure, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Now, we don't see this anymore, but all potato houses when I was a kid was uh, in the ground. Yes. Uh, the whole thing was surrounded by ground and by dirt. Yeah. Dirt and the the roof was right off the dirt. Yeah. And then you had just the opening at the bottom for. Um, so this would keep potatoes cool in the summer, fairly but warm you, in the winter. You, you, you fairly could keep your potatoes longer in the spring. You could uh, ship potatoes sometimes in the. Uh, May and first part of June, that they look fairly, fairly new, fairly. Do you remember what the temperature was in those potato houses? Oh, you, the temperature would go in the fifties, depending on how much potatoes there was yeah. in the in the potato house. Potatoes gives a lot of heat, you know. Now, once in a while, you'd have a disaster in the, in the potato, in storage. Uh, what would happen there? I remember going there, the, the smell was unbelievable. The potatoes were all rotten. Oh, yeah. What would cause that? I've lost houses full of potatoes. Uh, really? Hold them to the dump. What causes would... Oh! You say heat you have, one? You have a problem. You have a blight problem in the fall. The bright problem that would uh, deteriorate the potatoes in the in the winter time uh, could be a number of things. Uh, you could have a, a wet spot in the field. If you harvest the wet spot in the field and you put it on a with, with a pile of potatoes, it deteriorates the whole uh, the whole pile. And uh, you know, there's a variety of things that. Can happen. That's probably true with all crops, huh? Cause well, you, yes. You yes. hear uh, one rotten potato in the barrel will spoil the whole. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And that's so, why that today they have a better control of that because if they have a wet spot, they don't put it with the other potatoes. They harvest it at the end, and they put it somewhere where they can uh, get rid of it or. A wet spot is what? Like uh, the ground is... It's a, a low spot. And there's water there. It's a low spot and it got water damage. And you never notice when you harvest it. Oh, you don't. It doesn't show when you harvest it. But as soon as the heat gets into them... In the so how, how do you find out? How do you know that this uh, we shouldn't put these with the others? Well, you know where your low spots are. Yeah. And you don't harvest the low spots. Okay. Stay away from right that. over it. Yeah. Now, in Frenchville and on Market Street, Fort Kent, you had potato storage houses, uh, yeah. one after the other, yeah. uh, which we don't have any anymore. I no. don't think there's one, there's probably one left, but it's not used for that. That's right. And so and they had a cement wall between each uh, potato house, yeah. and that was where you stored potatoes. Yeah, uh, yeah. That cement wall was called a firewall. Firewall. Yes. Because uh, if something would happen, some fire would develop from one end or the other, one potato house to the other, a firewall would help. Might not save the building, but at least it would help until help arrives so you can maybe save your other building. Yeah. Now let's say you had a, a, a potato house full of potatoes and the, the one next to you burnt. Did that affect yours quite a bit? The, well, the not really if the fire wouldn't catch on yours. So the firewall protected. The uh, firewall has some protection, not 100%, no. but it has maybe a 50% protection. Now who owned those, uh, the, the, on Market Street here from the from the railroad station all the way to Doris Cafe now, yeah. they had potato houses. Oh yeah. So who owned those? Individual farmers? Individual farmers owned that, yes. So you would build, as a farmer, you would build a potato house next to the track? Yes. Because railroad 
was a way that you got rid of your potatoes? Yes, was a way of transportation then. Very little done by truck. Well, the truck came into play, I don't know, maybe in the, I would say in the late 50s, yeah. 60s. Yeah, because, uh, you know, when I was a kid, uh, it's very seldom that you, you saw a trailer truck go by. Yeah. You have had Coles Express, though? Yeah. Or Donald's Express? Yeah. But yeah. they delivered uh, building material and yeah. stuff like that. Oh, yeah. But potatoes were transported by train. Oh, yeah. It was all, all by train. All by train. All by train, yeah. So you had these potato houses right there, and uh, you yeah. could load right direct yeah. into the... Uh, yeah, yeah. Isn't that something, huh? I've loaded quite a bit on, on cars myself. Did you have a potato house along yeah, the railroad track? Potato. You did. So the big farmers in Fort Kent there, there was uh, the Karens. The Karens are still are still operating. Are still doing it, yeah. You, you, you have the Karens. you got three Karens who are doing it. And then the... Soldier Pond, the Pish Pass, huh? So the pond is no more. No more, no more Nigel Lake. No, no more Nigel Lake. No more west of Fort Kent is, is um, No, it's George, George is still planting. Oh, George Peltz. But very little in, so in the, on, on that area. He rents land everywhere. So oh, okay. He, that's what he. Oh, so he doesn't have the farms there. It's well, he's got a small place. farm there. Yeah. I don't know how big it is, but he's got a How farm. about Hermel Martin, St. Francis? Uh, I think that he's still growing maybe still growing. 10 acres or something like that. I know that he was the last hand uh, operation. Yeah, uh, I, well, I think he still is. Still is, yeah. I think he still is. In Fort Kent here uh, 20 years ago, I filmed uh, Gerald uh, shot it. On, oh yeah, on Charlotte Hill, who was picking by hand. Yeah, and yeah. I think he was the last one in Fort Kent. Uh, maybe so. I uh, maybe so. Now, what happened to uh, you? Got interested in a turkey farm. What What was that? Well, that was uh, that was before uh, that was before my my episode with uh, with uh, layer laying hens. So that was right at... Somebody was uh, after me to uh, put in uh, 500 turkeys, grow 500 turkeys, and they would take care of them, you know, they would uh, buy them when I slaughtered them. Well, I did that. That was early in your career there. Yes, that was in the early 50s, early 50s. And uh, I, we did pretty well. I uh, slaughtered my own turkeys, and I sold them. I did pretty well with The next year, well, I I put in a thousand turkeys. So what did you do? You, you, you bought them from, from where? Oh, I bought them a day old. Chicks. Yeah, a day old? A day old, yes. Grow them a day old. You can buy anywhere. Uh, a lot of farmers. Mine came from Massachusetts. My uh, young chicks. And you'd feed them all summer. I'd feed them all summer. And they would grow to normal. And, and uh, oh, white. one year, one year, the year I had them on range, they were white turkeys, and uh, I had quite a few turkeys of over twenty pounds. Really? So they were good sized turkeys. So but you that was a lot of problem. I had a lot of problems with uh, growing turkeys on range. They're very susceptible to uh, noise, and uh, especially when there was some uh, thunderstorms coming. Oh, uh, I remember a few times me and my wife would go in the field when the thunderstorms would come in, and we'd stop them from smothering each other. They'd jump on one on top of the other, especially in the corner of the fields. Oh, they, they'd they, smother. Is that right? So you'd go in there and you'd scatter them out. <laughs> and uh, I, I think she remembers that very easily too. <laughs> Holy Christ. Yeah. So it happened that they did smother. 
oh, yes. each other, and you found them dead. Oh, when you don't, when we don't scatter them, yes. Oh, yes. How many did you lose at one time? Oh, I uh, didn't lose that many then. I, I mean, on, because we were warned. Oh. We were warned that they would do that. But in the, in the winter, in the, at night, my, they come into the barn, the shed, and they nest down in the shed. Well, one day, we had a hired girl. One day, uh, the hired girl uh, comes to wake us up around 2 o'clock in the morning. She said, all your turkeys are out. So we all got out, and they had jumped against, somebody had scared them, and they had piled against the, a barn door, and they had opened the barn door. By their the weight. The barn door would, would slide up, and they went out. So it took us two hours. We rounded them all up, and they said, well, Lo and behold, you will not open that door again. So I put some PVs and some bars against the door so they wouldn't open up that door. The next morning, I got up next morning around 7 o'clock, I could see some white feathers to the top of the door. They had jumped up and piled each other they in? They had piled each other and they were on top of the door. 278. That I lost that morning. Holy jeez. I was suffocated. My God, because somebody scared him. I never knew. I, I really, I had a, a notion that somebody wanted a turkey for uh, Thanksgiving, <laughs> and that's what scared them. But I don't know what, what the hell scared them. Now, you say you slaughtered them. That means you took the, 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 the feathers. Feathers off. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, Susie, uh, then uh, Susie had their store. A.D. Susie. A.D. Susie had their store, and he had a, uh, uh, a machine that you would uh, hold the chick, the turkey by the legs, and it would Take the feathers it off. It would take the feathers out. It was little rubber on a roll, about this long, and that would turn, and it would take the feathers out. And then you had to uh, take the insides out. Oh, yeah, you had to eviscerate them. So it was quite a job.